What's going on, collective listeners? How are we doing today? Uh, another episode. Obviously, appreciate you guys being here as always. Today we got Kendrick Pratt. It's an awesome, awesome episode. Uh, just wrapped it up actually, and the the overall theme and the overarching theme is really built around how to handle yourself as not just like an intern, but somebody who needs to be able to show certain levels of competency, but also certain levels certain levels of vulnerability, right? When it comes to like, hey, here's what I'm good at. Here's where I need work, right? But like doing it in a way where there's some some massaging of being able to say, hey, I'm still someone. I'm still super competent. I'm still someone you can rely on. I'm still you know, extremely qualified for my job, but here are the areas that I need to continue building on to make sure that we're continue moving forward. So uh, it's a great one. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. And uh, yeah, let's get it going. Daniel, what's going on, man? How you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Appreciate you hopping on. For all listeners, Daniel Guzman is here today. And uh, as he alluded to before we got on, if you're talking to his Mexican ancestors, it'd be Guzman. So whatever you whatever you feel you want to go with. But uh, glad to have you on. Appreciate it. Obviously, we've already chatted a little bit. So I'm super excited about what you're going to talk about today and just some of the conversation that we'll have. But really just want to start off by giving you a chance to obviously highlight your journey, um, talk a little bit about your experiences. So you can, you know, introduce yourself and then take us as far back as you'd like to, you know, where this whole thing started to where you're at now and, and what you're up to now. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. I guess my story starts back probably 10 years ago in college where I wasn't fully sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that uh, I enjoyed training. I played college soccer and I really enjoyed the process of improving myself off the field so that I could perform better on the field but I didn't think I could make a career out of it. I thought exercising was more about looking good and that was basically it. And I had a really good professor who was a strength coach of a gym in town that he owned called Prevail Conditioning. And his name's Chris Eklund. And he taught me that you can actually make people faster and you can improve their performance outside of just looking good. Of course, body composition can be important, right? But sure. When he taught me that you can get faster, the first thing I thought was, okay, my entire life I've been told you can't teach speed. You're just naturally fast. Like you can't teach it. And that's what I believed in. Right. And when I realized not only did he get me a little faster, but that he was also coaching other people of all ages and different populations to improve their speed for whatever reason, I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. Right. I mean, I'm sure you've heard that too, right? You can't teach speed. I feel like that's something that's yeah. out there a lot right yeah i have heard that before yeah it's it's been it's been a while because i feel like speed has been something that's kind of like <laughs> taking its own like like i mean speed is almost like a trend now right in the strength and conditioning industry yeah. whereas before yeah it was like unheard of but news to me that you know working out is more than just the aesthetics but i'll let you continue <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know just, just finding no, this fair out enough <laughs> i mean now i have different reasons for doing it but no it's good so <laughs> yeah i did that internship my girlfriend now my wife uh, at the time she says you know the way that your brain thinks you have to try and be the best at everything but you should really consider like how can you be the best of your own standard right don't compare yourself to others and for you to be the best where's the best internships or place you can go to work and so i looked around at that time i was like okay uh exos was athletes performance cressy performance and mike Bull strength conditioning that's all that i knew right uh, also to franco's but uh i was a little bit intimidated it's like man this guy's the man super strong train a lot of guys so yeah. I would like to go to his too, but what worked out was that athletes performance in LA, I lived in Santa Barbara at the time, mm. had a spot open for an internship. I took the internship. And I think why that's important to talk about this part is because I went to the internship hoping to get a job that didn't happen, came back for their NFL combine prep. And the LA Galaxy started a second division team called the LA Galaxy 2. Mm. And I remember being in the office and the boss came in and was like, hey, we have this contract, kind of it's in progress but uh, we need one of you guys to go service it. And as an intern, I was like, I'll do it. Like, and no one else want, they're like, oh, I don't really want to work with soccer. And these are all great coaches, but they just didn't want to do it. Yeah. And so he was like, okay, we'll see if they're up for it. So I went there, I played college soccer. So obviously there was a little bit of a connection there. Sure. And when you work strength conditioning in any sport, I think if you've played that sport to some degree, you just gain a little bit more respect. Like you're a football guy or a soccer guy or a basketball guy. Right. And so I did that. Um, little bit free and then I got paid down the road for it for a few months the first head the head strength coach of the first team ends up leaving in the summer and same thing like hey put my name in the hat want to apply and they're like you're 23 years old you're not really ready for a head snc position to which I said actually I think I am <laughs> you know I think it's about the relationships and the fact that like I can do this but I completely understand and then two days later I had an interview because the head coach of the second team went to the the GM and basically is like this is the guy that showed up when no one else would yeah. And so I think he deserves a shot. 
So super thankful for them for giving my chance. And then of course, Exos was like, yeah, if they believe in you, go do it. Sure. So three years at LA Galaxy, got to win an MLS Cup there, which was fun. Then I That's went to awesome. the US men's national team, which I just couldn't turn down. That was a one year journey, but it was super insightful about how to manage players from all across the world and have these big competitions. Sure. So that was really fun. And then when that ended, I went to LAFC, Los Angeles Football Club, which was a new startup. And obviously mm -hmm. they're a lot bigger now just won MLS Cup last year. And I was there for four years, uh, attempted to leave, but they couldn't fill the role fast enough. And so sure. I came back as a consultant for a few months. Um, since then, I ran my own business for a year just to have more family time because I wanted to really work on myself as a professional. And I, I just thought if I go back into strength conditioning with a team, I need to be better than I am now because I just feel like I'm doing kind of the same things that everyone else is doing. I have my own style. I'm having some success, but I need to be way better if I really want to stand out from the rest. Um, and now, which we can get into a little bit, I work for genetics company, but I won't, I won't jump in too much there, but that's yeah. kind of my journey to where I'm at now. Yeah. That's a sweet journey. It's, it's wild. I, I'm just laughing at the, uh, I mean, the, I think that that's a, like a, one thing I want to point out is the, the particular scenario where you were like, well, actually, I think I am ready, right? Like they're like, Hey, listen, we're not really <laughs> sure if you're ready for this. And I think yeah. that that's, that's something that, you know, given, Right. Like if you feel like you're in a position where you can handle that stuff. Right. And you, you felt conf you obviously felt confident enough to say, like, I think I think for a lot of like young listeners out there, like, I think that's something to pay attention to. Right. Like not just necessarily just, you know, sh taking a shot in the dark kind of thing. But like if you feel like you've earned the right and you feel like you've you know, got a little bit of skin in the game and you feel like, you know, it doesn't hurt to just say that you think you're ready. What's the worst that happens? They say no. You know what I mean? If, they, if, if that happens. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah. You know, and I think like even just getting a shot to like, hey, this guy thinks he's ready or this girl thinks he's ready. She's ready. Well, they just, you know, get, get them in an interview room, you know what I mean? Just kind of see what I happens. mean, I think part of it is like the conviction you show, if you truly believe that you're ready for an opportunity, I knew that there was a lot for me to learn, but I just thought as far as managing stress in a high stress situation in pro sports, hmm. I was ready to take that on. I feel like I was a very composed person. Yeah. And also I didn't want to be afraid not to step out there. I know there's certain roles where you're like, I really need to be ready for this role. I, I want to make sure that I have all the skill sets. But in this case, I was like, okay. Like I'm an athlete myself. Uh, I have a good understanding of how to get athletes stronger in a simple sense. And I think if I come in with a very simple approach and athletes see improvement, that's going to be more important than this complex system at the beginning. And the truth is when I first went there, uh, again, people were like, you're crazy for doing this. For the first three months, whatever the athletes wanted to do, the program they were on, I, I came in mid-season. I didn't want to change anything. Right. So I just ran the programs they were already on. And some of them was like, hey, all I do is these 12 different crunch exercises. And in my head, I'm rolling my eyes like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but I was committed for the first 90 days. Just do what they want to do. Come alongside them. And the cool thing was with that one athlete, world-class athlete doing his 12 crunching exercises, I was like, hey, how about, you know, like th 30 days in, I said, how about we add in one of my exercises? And because I had a little bit of relationship, he was like, okay, let's do that. Damn. And so by the end of the 90 days it was actually one of his original. And then we had five or six, you know, anti-rotation, anti-flexion, whatever it might be, adding in some lower body as well. And he was like, okay, this actually feels pretty good. But he was like, this is my program. Not, not that I gave it to him. In his right. head, he was like, I developed this. So sure. it was just an interesting approach, but it ended up working out for me to help build the trust first before I was like, hey, look how smart I am. It's more about how can I get you to trust me that I'm along this, alongside with you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a theme that we talk about a lot on this podcast. A lot of the guests is right. Like I think, and, and I, I don't know if it needs to be continued to be touched upon, right? The idea of developing trust and establishing a relationship really early on. And, um, and, and maybe it does, but now we're getting to the point where it's like, all right, well, like there's so many different ways to go about doing it. And every situation presents a different way that you have to connect with a different human being in a different scenario. Right. So um, I think in your situation, right, a lot of strength coaches would go in there and be like, all right, we're tearing it down. This dude only does 12 crunches yeah. or whatever, like 12 different types of ab exercises. Like we're tearing it down. We're coming into my ideas, but obviously you had, you know, you put your ego aside, right? You, you say that, hey, listen, like this is what, you know, needs to get done. And obviously you're going to create this buy-in and then you start to slowly implement your thing, which I think, I think I, I've seen happen a good amount. And I, I like, you know, I've seen some good stuff happen in the world's training conditioning. You know what I mean? In that regard, yeah, right? of like course. taking, you know, taking a look at like what's been done, what was successful and then kind of just like, you know, slowly, subtly adding some change. But I think it's good to hear that, you know what I mean? And, and for you to give a specific example, like the one you just gave, because I think yeah. a lot of people say that like they do, but like you, you go in there and you know, it's like, this dude does what? It's 12 different <laughs> ab exercises. And this well, is you know, we go to these conferences, I think, and especially strength conditioning, we want to impress our peers. When you go to the conferences, you see this clean cut, like here's this perfect system I run. 
And I remember as a younger coach sitting there like, man, I just must be the worst strength coach ever because <laughs> worst. like the setting I'm in is so messy and yeah. I'm having to make audibles to my program every single day. And it's never as clean and cut as that. Yeah. And now like 10 years later, I'm like, you know what? I think they're trying to show what are the right things to do. And obviously you're speaking at a conference, but I think of like my approach, if I had the opportunity to speak at a big conference, I would actually show all the messy stuff yeah. and say like, yeah, here's my starting program. But like at the end of the week, here's what actually happened. Sure. You know, we got to a same result, but you know, some player had a leg injury or someone was just really tired the night before. Someone yeah. just came with a bad attitude because they hate the weight room. Yeah. And so I had to adapt the program for them or I had to do something different just to get some sort of stimulus. And sometimes that goes on for four or five months. You're like, okay, <laughs> like let's just do like two sets of split squats. And if you do that, then I'm satisfied for the day. Yeah. And so I, I think it would be helpful for people to see like, here's kind of the stuff that tends to happen more, at least on the team side, you know, team side, it's a little bit different because there's always different variables coming through. Yeah. Interesting. A lot of different variables. I think, you know, it's funny cause I feel like I, like I work in the private sector now and I think that's one of the things that I deal with is like, I felt, I felt the same way. I'm like, oh, you're a terrible coach because there's all these like, you know, requests or like adjustments <laughs> that are being asked for or whatever. And I'm like, you must just have like crap programs or whatever. But, um, and then recently, like, obviously like when you work in like the, you know, the, the, the the business side of the private sector, right? Like the under, and I, and that's the reason why I like my job is because it teaches me the, like, I have to have a good understanding of like mm. customer service through like the, the medium of the human body. Right. Which is a pretty like new concept from like a virtual perspective. Right. So like, yeah. you know, I think like it, it gives me a little bit of that exposure to those skills, but it's also understanding like, all right, like, what do they think is valuable, right? And like, what do they see in terms of yeah. like the value that you can provide? But I think it's like getting to a point where you're like, All right, I can actually sort of communicate, you know, the way that I think the value, you know, is going to be provided, how we're going to make this impact. Um, but I think a lot of like what I've found myself talking about a lot is how like the program itself, you can get a program anywhere, you can find exercises anywhere. I mean, it's all over the place. Like, you have yeah. no, there's no scarcity of information out there in terms of like program, but like the program to me is exactly what you're describing, right? The program itself is like the day to day navigation, the cohesion, the collaboration between yourself, you know, the emotional intelligence to read athletes, to listen to them for, you know, them to have the ability to even open up to you to have that line of communication. Like, that's the program, like the other yeah. the thing that's on paper, and like, whatever you devise or whatever on your laptop, that's just a guideline, in my opinion, you know, I think everything else is the, the program is like the day to day, you know what I mean? Like what? So I'm really happen. curious, like in the private setting, like what is your path to portray that to someone that hasn't signed up yet? Like, you're, like they come in, like they're kind of interested, yeah. but it's easier to show that. It's you like, hey, like do you give them a free session or do you just like how do you how do you almost sell that vision to them? Because I'm I think yeah. that's helpful to know. No, I I agree. I think it's tough because like it's tough to sell that without developing the trust first which the trust yeah. takes time right so like yeah. that's that's the, the that's like the sort of the dichotomy you run into where it's like hey it's going to take time for me to get to a point where you're actually going to value what i'm saying and not just see me as someone who's trying to sell you something you know what i mean um but what i do is i try to show it like right off the bat just in terms of like my desire to want to get to know about them and like all the things that like they are interested in and have going on in their life because Number one, obviously it shows that you care, right? Because I genuinely do. Like, and I know how important those yeah. things are. Like I have to have an understanding of like, how many kids do you have? Like, what is your, what's your schedule <laughs> look like? Right? Like, you know what I mean? Cause yeah. I mean, I don't have kids, but I would imagine, and like, I, I know people who do, I know things it's get crazy. It's nuts. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, I get it, you know? And so things like that. And so, but it also does is it shows like, oh, okay. So like, he's not asking me questions like specifically about like exercises. So, well, you know, it kind of like gives them the inclination that like, oh, so there's much more than just like this, like the actual technical aspects of like a program yeah. or whatever the program is like, hey, like, this is a guy who spent, you know, X amount of years trying to understand just like, you know, navigating ad adaptation, stimulus, things like that, right? Like you said, like load management, right? Things like that. So um, yeah. if we're going to do those things, I didn't know how important that would be in the private sector, but I found like it's wildly important, right? And so I'm like, yeah, oh, this course. is cool. Cause like, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to do like some of the things that I'm generally interested in, right? So um, what I, yeah, what I really try to do like any other situation is just try to get to know them first, but like also like most of my conversation mm -hmm. with them yeah. is revolved around like the external pieces. Like, hey, like I understand, you know, it's a really tough time for your company right now, right? Like I'll like, you know, you try to keep, you know, obviously like tech, for example, is like a really wild world right now, right? So I'm like, yeah. hey, I know it's a really tough time for your company right now. I'm sure you're under a lot of stress. Um, how do you feel, you know, your training is going in cohesive, cohesive, you know, cohesion with like your nutrition and, yeah, you know, just your, asking is your wife still, questions. yeah, yeah. Like intentional questions that like have to do with it. Cause when they, when you ask someone a personal question, like, Hey, is, you know, how's your, how's your wife doing? And you use her name and you say like, is she still making you those meals at night that you're like, you know, that you feel go well with your training? You know, it's like, yeah. they're like, Oh, like this dude's like paying attention. And like, he's like, <laughs> so there's a lot more to the, you know, so yeah, they feel heard, which is important. 
yeah so that's I, I guess like i mean we could create like a whole separate podcast on that so i hope that kind of answers your question but that's how i try to do it it's not well, i just think no it's exact valuable because whether you're in private or team sport or whatever it is like just getting to know the human yeah and so i think we've all learned as we've done more s and c is like the x's and o's and the rep sets and reps of s and c is it's just like like secondary to actually understanding who the human is yeah. and if you just ask them questions the whole session who they are sometimes like therapy, you know, and then yeah. they get stronger. And they're like, this is hitting every box. Like, emotionally, I feel like I'm being checked in on. Yeah, of course, physically, I'm, I'm growing. And it's actually someplace I enjoy being I think that's really the human side of what we're doing. I agree. I, I think transparency too. like, I think, well, the one thing that I've always felt was like important is like, if you leave a place, and you know, the athletes or the people you're working with say, hey, you know, you, you kind of like pay attention to like the, the thing that they thank you for, right? They'd be like, hey, man, like, it was really great working with you. Thank you so much for always doing X, right? And yeah. so I pay, I try to pay attention to those things. I think the one the more important things is like when they say, hey, thanks for always being honest with me. Like, thanks for always being straightforward. And I always felt like I could, I always knew where I stood with you. And I always, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so, yeah, of um, course. And in, in in in, 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 I don't think you get that unless you're like respectful of them, right? Like, you, you know what I mean? They, they, they usually don't say that to a guy who's like constantly barking up and down, you know, barking on it, you know, just like getting out, right? So usually like, yeah. thanks, thanks for just just like thanks for being patient with me thanks for understanding and just thanks for being so you know what i mean so i think that that's like that's a that's a major part of it is like there are times where i kind of have to have some like uncomfortable conversations where i have to be like somewhere like hey listen like i know i've been like pretty empathetic and pretty sympathetic to what's going on but like you haven't completed a full week of workouts in like five months <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, of like, course you know what i mean let's uh let's you know you get it done or you're not you know what i mean right so like that's one of those things but um Anyway, so yeah, uh, why don't you obviously, I, you know, I want to make sure you have enough time to obviously talk about like what you're doing now and some of the things that we talked about. Yeah, phone, sure. It sounds fascinating. So yeah, I would love to yeah, let, let you take it away. I mean, it kind of goes in line with like us talking about getting to know the human. So I was working my own business, Goose and Performance, um, which was majority just training athletes online. And then I would do some pro in-person stuff. Hmm. And I get this text from a close friend of mine one day and he says, in two minutes, somebody really important is going to call you. Whatever you do, answer the call. And for the next however many hours he wants to talk, you talk to him. I go, I go, okay. I tell my wife, hey, I might miss dinner tonight. Like, I don't know how long it's going to go. That's wild. You know, that like, sounds like something straight out of a movie, like a phone booth or something like that. You're like, no, a honestly. Booth or something, like Matrix or whatever. I was just like, who's watching me right now? Yeah, right. So I just come into my office and take this call from Tony Sue, who's the chairman of 3X4 Genetics. He owns a bunch of other companies. And he's just a really great person. Like, I'm just enjoying talking with him about business stuff and he owns this genetics company. And so he's trying to ask me, you know, like, how do I understand genetics in the, in the pro sports world? And I was like, well, any strength coach would tell you, like, we can kind of see like, Oh, they're genetically gifted, right? Like they're super powerful or like great endurance, or they just got some quality where we talk about good genes or bad genes, which I've learned now there is no good. They're not, it's not good and bad. It's mm -hmm. like genes expressed on and off, which is, we'll get to that later. Yeah. But anyways, I talked to him. Great chat. The next day he texts me and said, Hey, I'm going to be in town. Can we go get a smoothie? I'm like, sure. Love smoothies. <laughs> we go talk again. And, uh, it just becomes this good friendship over the next few months. Now I'm still consulting at LAFC. And so I'm starting to tell the players like, Oh, I'm looking more into genetics and trying to understand like, how can we best quantify this? Mm -hmm. And what it comes back to is when all of us in performance right now, are trying to work on this equation of training equals performance, which isn't even a real formula, right? But training means uh, like training stress, recovery. I drove to work and someone cut me off. So emotional stress or, or mm -hmm. psychological stress, whatever it might be, we are trying to manipulate that so that we can improve performance. And what I learned was that our genetics make up more than 60% of our performance. And when I, when I read about that, I thought, okay, if it's more than 60% and we are quantifying 0% of that, we are missing everything when it comes to actually understanding who our athlete is. Right. I was like, that makes no sense because the real equation is genetics plus training equals performance. Okay. But I was yeah. like, okay, I can quantify the training side with, you know, like some sort of jump testing, speed testing, strength testing, whatever it might be, but I can't quantify the genetics. And so moving forward now, now that I work for the company, uh, I'm working on a project called GeneFit. And what GeneFit is, it's the first athlete and team optimization software in the world that takes your genetics with any physiological data you're collecting. So mm. that could be GPS, that could be heart rate, that could be an aura ring um, or any other type of HRV you're taking. And so now when we see that, you know, we have our athletes that are in, in, in the soccer world, they're running 10 to 12 kilometers in a game. 
well, if everyone ran the same, then we'd have these general recovery recommendations. Okay, we need an ice bath or do some manual uh, massage, whatever it might be, <clears throat> maybe a breathing routine or something with your sleep. Right. But in general, it is very general. Nothing is really that specific. And unless you're using genetics, you cannot be super hyper personalized in your, in your recommendations. And so now that we can quantify the genetics piece by looking at all these SNPs, these genetic variations that tell us, you know, how do we metabolize caffeine, which is a really cool gene. I think it's, um, it, it comes off uh, a spectrum where you look at if you are a fast metabolizer of, or slow metabolizer of caffeine. Mm -hmm. So practically, what does that mean? At least in pro sports, we've got a timer 30 minutes before the match. Timer goes off, people come and take their espresso or caffeine pill or whatever they want to take for the game as a performance enhancer. Mm. Well, if you don't know where you sit, if you're a fast or slow metabolizer, if you possess this gene, well, then you're not being very specific at all. For some guys, they need to take their caffeine 90 minutes or longer before the, the event starts. For someone like myself, I've got, um, I've got the gene where I've got to take it 30 minutes before. I might metabolize it so quick that I've got to take it again at halftime. That's, right. that's just one thing we're looking at across like a that's broad, right. like spectrum, all this kind of stuff. So we have these pathways, you know, injury pathways, and you have all these different injury SNPs or genetic variations that fill into this. And you've got recovery and you've got, uh, you know, training stuff like strength and endurance and um, power and all this kind of stuff. And if we can quantify that, which is what we're doing now, we can take that with the training side and just be even, you know, more specific with the recommendations. So it's not that it's replacing guys like you and I, you still need really good experts, but it's giving us the tools to understand where's the athlete actually starting. And then how can we build from there in real time? Yeah. Which I just yeah. thought was fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I would imagine like, I'm not even sitting here thinking that that cuts us out. I, I actually think that it almost gives us more, um, you know, it's just a little bit more emphasis on what we do because someone's got to find not, someone's not only got to obtain this information, but someone's got to make sense of it. Right. Because I would imagine it's exactly. not like, just because it's like, like I, I had like a genetic or my brother had a genetic test done and it said that he was, you know, kind of going with the caffeine thing, like very sensitive to caffeine. Right. So like, that's pretty yeah. interesting. Like there's this information, like there's a ton of information that it gives off, but I would imagine like the tests that you guys are running and like the way you're getting some of this feedback, like what is kind of like the system you go through in terms of like, is that, is that like the right question? I guess next is like, yeah, what's yeah. The you're, you're kind you of asking through? like, what is the athlete experience when we sign them up? Right, so, yeah. so gene fit is under the umbrella of three X four genetics. 3X4 Genetics was founded by Dr. Yael Jaffe out of South Africa, and it's all um, around the uh, study of nutrigenomics. So she's looking at how can your how can your DNA uh, influence certain genes. So your DNA does not change. That's like makes sure anyone that doesn't know your genetics don't change, but you have certain genes that are expressed on or off. Okay. And sometimes we need our environment. So supplementation, lifestyle, whatever it might be. We need that stuff to express the gene on or off, right? But the, the value of this is that 3X4 Genetics has their blueprint test, which I highly recommend to everyone. Uh, it's definitely changed my own life. I had a ton of digestive issues for the past like 14 years. And I was like, I'm just that guy that's got stomach issues and I can't yeah. eat certain foods. And it's just something I got to live with every single week. Super painful. I've done a bunch of stuff. I take the 3X4 blueprint. I talk to one of the world leading nutrigeneticists, one of their practitioners. And she's like, tell me like, oh, you really suffer from high inflammation. That is what your, your body, that is what your genes are saying about how your body, um, <clears throat> the insights into your, how your body reacts. Mm. So then I start looking at stuff that inflammation that she's guiding me through. And it just completely changed my life. Like I just, I have such a better, I would say I have more hope for my health path right now. And mm. I feel way better. So sorry, that's my own experience. What does yeah. the athlete experience get, right? Well, well, so the before, before you go on, because I think there are a lot of people who are probably interested in this from a personal perspective as well, right? Like, listen, because I'm sitting yeah. here thinking, I'm like, wow, if, this, if that's your personal per So that you can go through three X, the 3X Sport Genetics, the 3X Sport Blueprint in order to try to obtain some of the similar feedback that you got. Is that what you said? Yeah, so the 3X4 Blueprint, you go in there, if you order a test, it's really cool. It's, it's I would say it's minimally evasive. You know, it's not a blood test. It's just a cotton swab okay. inside of the cheek for a few minutes. You send it back. And then from there, you'll get linked with a practitioner in your area through the practitioner locator, and they will walk you through your uh, genetic insights through a really digestible readout that we have. Okay. And that is that is more like the direct consumer model. The athletes get a lot more of a white glove service. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Um, and then the one thing I'm just thinking about, like the general theme of this for like people to try to wrap their minds around, right, is the idea that like DNA can influence your genetic or how DNA influences your genetics. Is that correct? 
Yes. Yeah, so your genetics are telling you more about who you are as a person. That That is the best way to understand. Our genetics are just a code and the code is a language. And so you, we know that in, in the genetics code that sometimes one letter might be changed and it completely change everything. So imagine if I have the word coat, I say, hey, Anthony, go put on a coat. You put on the coat. But I'm like, you know what? That C is going to change to a G. Well, now you're wearing a goat and you're like, this is not what I meant to be wearing right now. <laughs> I don't want to wear, you know, <laughs> yeah. but like that happens all, all the time in genetics that these letters are just changing. And so uh, I think a statement that I feel very, very confident in saying is that if you're a performance coach or, or a strength conditioning coach and you are not looking at genetics in the next five years, you are going to be so far behind the rest mm -hmm. of the industry. And I think like the same way that people are really diving into programming to help with better data visualizations people really should start to look at genetics. It's going to be the future of sports because now we have a way to quantify it. That's a lot more digestible. This is wild. All right. I got some ideas. A whole new world, but, yeah. but let me explain like how gene fit works. Cause that's, yeah. that's a little bit different. Okay. So gene fit is the athlete optimization and team software, right? So now we're taking the GPS heart rate, whatever physiological tracking they take. And we're overlaying with their genetic insights. We're using the three explore blueprint to get the DNA. And then we are taking all of their training load or whatever they want to look at to get real time feedback into how that athlete's responding to training. And so what the athlete is getting is we'll show up, we'll swab the entire team. We'll send a test back. Then we'll have our uh, practitioners come in and the practitioners will do readouts with every single athlete and tell every athlete, here's how your body is made. And here's what your genetics are saying about uh, the environment that we can change and what your lifestyle changes might need to be, or some supplementations that we can give to you. So it's going through that entire process. And then from there, we put that into our software where we can look at, you know, connective tissue, muscle tissue, bone tissue, and get really, really specific uh, with whatever that training loads from the week. And so like right now, what we're doing in sports, like if we take an aura ring, if we take GPS data, we see that and we're going off our acute chronic to try and make decisions to help, uh, you know, peak fitness to a match or a competition. So, which is good, like that's still going to be around, but when you have the genetics piece underlaying that you can be so much more specific with every athlete, it's just a whole new world out there. You still need good people to understand what to do with the data, but the fact that you have a better starting spot, it's not like Moneyball 2.0, it's, it's Moneyball 3.0. Like this is the end game because there's nothing that's more insightful than genetics for the human body. It's just, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah, that is nuts. That is wild. I have like like a zillion different ideas running through my mind right now. For being honest, I'm trying to like <laughs> yeah. trying to stay focused on one thing at a time. So, um, yeah, like I guess you know, in terms of, so you've had some. Obviously, you guys have gone through this a little, for a little while now. Like, how many years has this been going on for you? Like, like as far as like, if you give us kind of like a timeline of like where your thoughts were when you first started this versus like the progression of where you're at now, right? Like, is like yeah, like yeah, no, definitely in the right direction. You know what I mean? Like, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I'll say as far as like. <laughs> 3x4 genetics, this is decades and decades of research. So the science has been there, but typically it hasn't been something that's been, I would say, uh, like ready for the general consumer. Like when the Human Genome Project was going on back then, I can imagine it was like half a million dollars to get your genetics done, right? And now like if you go on 3x4genetics.com, you can get the blueprint for 300 bucks and do your DNA stuff. But DNA in, in the world of consumers, there's a lot going on because there's been some companies that have led people astray. I won't name the companies, but you can easily find it online where they sold people's data for hundreds of millions of dollars. And so there's a distrust in the market. Why would and they so sell think, the data? What's the value in that? Well, if they're selling insights, then marketers can sell certain oh. supplementation, that kind of stuff. They're like, oh, if we see a lot of people have this genetic variation, let's sell a supplement towards that genetic variation. Sweet. So I think the key things for us is like we're in it because we want to reach a billion lives. We right. really want to change the future of health. Yeah. And although that sounds like a little bit like too romantic and visionary. That's exactly what it is. We want to change, not, not just sport, but we want to change health. Yeah. And to do that, you have to gain the trust of the consumer again. And so something that we tell everyone we ever preach the story to is we will never sell your data ever. That is such personal information. We're not going to sell it. We're not trying to profit off that. We're trying to help you in your health journey. Yeah, so, that's awesome. so that's a huge thing there. The thing too is there's a bunch of laws around genetic, uh, genetic data. You can't just go spread so much genetic information um, there's a lot of protection from the state and, uh, federal laws that protect people, uh, whenever they're, you know, really concerned about is my data going to get out, Okay. you know? Yeah. So I think all that stuff's really important for people to know. And genetics is this whole new world to me, but it's been around for decades and decades. And 
as S and C's, it's not something that we're, we're, it's like not in our, um, you know, like our foundational courses that we're trying to learn our internships. Right. So it's tough to quantify, but now that we can quantify it, I just think it's going to take off in the future of sports, which would be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm assuming the athletes are pretty interested as well. Like, I mean, it's about them, right? Like they're, they're learning about themselves. So I would imagine, you, that, know, you know, what's, what's funny is that the athletes, one of their first questions, like, oh, are you going to clone me? And we're like, no, we're not, <laughs> we're not cloning you. Like once we take the swab and collect the data, like the swab gets discarded and that's it. Yeah. But what's really cool is that the athletes come out of their readouts with the practitioners and like you, they have so many questions and like, wow, this makes so much sense about who I am because I always thought that I had this going on and the practitioners by reading my genetic insights can see like, Hey, uh, do you have like an addictive personality? Do you love to be competitive in gaming? Because there, so there is an addictive gene, which is really cool to think about really? because you can help a lot of people that way. But what they found is that a lot of the elite athletes in the world have this addictive gene. And the reason why that's beneficial is because they want to continue to be achievers and get better at stuff. And so they are addicted to whatever that success might be. Right. And sometimes right. you think addicted genes like oh, addiction, that's not very good. But in a lot of athlete cases, it is good. Now, of course, they got to learn to hone that after the career ends. Sure. But there's just so many uh, genetic variations that are just they're just super cool to learn about. You know, like some like we are always taught with sleep. Oh, you've got to get like eight hours of sleep for the best recovery, which I would say is generally true. But that gives people a lot of stress. Like for me, I've got three kids. I don't sleep very well all the time. And I'm like, I just don't know if I can get that. I mean, I haven't got eight hours of sleep in five years. Yeah. It's just not going to happen for me. Yeah. But there's a small population of people that have this genetic variation where they only need four to five hours of sleep and they're good to go. And instead of them feeling the stress of like, I just never get seven hours of sleep, this gives them some confirmation. Like, actually, I'm, I'm like, this is how I was made to be. I'm not meant to be like everybody else. Yeah. So these genetic variations are just in everything we think about, like inflammation and training and brain chemistry. It's just a code that's telling our body how it's supposed to operate. And so I think the biggest phrase you hear athletes say when they do their genetic readouts, they say, I finally understand more about who I am than any other test I've ever done in my entire life. And now I just, I feel hope about where I'm going in the future. And I think by giving someone hope, that's when they get fully bought in. Like, okay, tell me what supplement I got to take or the lifestyle change I got to make. It, it like it gets the trust so much quicker that I just love my job. Like I love being able to do that with people. Yeah. It's fascinating. This is unbelievable. All right, I'm already looking online to figure out where I can learn this <laughs> test from. So is it, it, you said it's just 3X genetics. Is it the, um, yeah, I guess like where, where can people find this test if they wanted to go and just. So if they go to 3x4genetics.com, they can read all about the blueprint and the history of the company and the safety around everything. Okay. Yeah, I highly recommend. I mean, I've done it for my family and all my friends that I tell about. And people are able to make these changes that uh, are really life changing. I mean, for my wife, not to get too personal, but her story is pretty powerful. She's had um, just some like brain health issues that were going on for a long time. And just for her to have some really specific knowledge around like this exact supplement is something that my body doesn't, I don't absorb this vitamin, this nutrient well enough. And so this supplement can really support me. And then you see a change like that. And that's when I was like, okay, you hit home because you hit my wife. And if you get the mother of the family that's really connected in, that that changes everything. So now yeah. I was fully bought in even more so than myself. And now at some point doing it for my kids, like I just want to have a good starting point. That's what it's really about. Like knowing where you need to start and then what decisions to make from there. Right. Identifying, knowing where to start. Yeah, I'm writing some of this. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a bit. I'm going to do a big sell <laughs> job to my family right now. So yeah, <laughs> this is a, I'm taking, make, making this super personal. But yeah, so I, I think that, yeah, I think that's awesome though. And I think that that story that you just described is probably something that everybody can resonate with though. Like, everybody's probably got some sort of what it's like I've came in, I've come across this particular issue at one point or another. It's like, don't necessarily feel like I have the answers, right. But you can find out more. So I guess like I have, I have two questions. The first one being like, if you could give like somewhat of a, you know, a, like a, not like a sales pitch, but like a, just like an understand, like a breakdown of like the, the type of information that like someone can receive from taking this test and like the value of that information, right? Like you make it, you don't have to, I'm sure, I'm sure it, takes i'm sure it measures a ton of different things right but if you want to maybe give like some some aspects or some metrics that you think no definitely so so let me give you from the athlete expect uh, experience because that's yeah. what i'm working on with gene fit so like okay. we said like the white glove service we come in we do the test we get our practitioners to read out with every single athlete that gets the test done <clears throat> we combine it with your training load and so some of the insights of the athletes and the teams will get av uh, available to them is like, you know, as strength coaches, we try and put people in buckets. Like, okay, they need more power. We got to work on strength theory. We might need to work on mobility, whatever it might be. And now with Gene Fit, you can see that easily categorized. So imagine we have training, right? And then in the training pathway, 
we're looking at something like, to keep it simple, like endurance, right? Well, now we can see in three different verticals, which athletes need to prioritize endurance, which athletes need to maintain and which are kind of just in the middle yeah. where it's like, it, you know, of course everyone needs endurance. It's not saying you don't need it, but it's saying the athletes that got to prioritize it. We might need to put a little bit more emphasis there because it might be a little bit more difficult for them to achieve an endurance base than someone else, right? Sure. If we look at something like uh, injury genes, which is going to be a huge one in every single sport and injury pathways, there's going to be some athletes that, yeah, they might have genes or people might say they're gifted where they may not be prone as a starting point to injuries as much as someone else that their genes, whether it's their collagen formation, whatever it might be. I have the genetic variation where I'm at uh, an increased risk of some tendon issues, which is not good, but there's a solution for me, right? It's strength training, plyometric training, and making sure that my loading, if I'm playing a sport is consistent. I'm not just one day saying, I'm going to go run 20 miles out of nowhere. You know, as strength coaches, we know we understand periodization and like appropriate progressions. And so for someone like me, that's what I would need. And it doesn't mean that the person that is gifted in the injury side doesn't need a proper progression. They 100% do. True. And any injury you have, of course, that's going to be the biggest precursor to a future injury. But you just got to make sure that you understand that for some people, the path to power might be just a little bit more difficult than someone that's naturally powerful, right? Sure. It's not saying you can't get there. It's just saying that you've got to be a little bit more specific and they got to hire someone like us to get them there. No doubt. So I think by being able to see that you can put these things in buckets, right? Prioritization, maintaining, whatever it might be. The same things for nutrition, which that just completely changes the game. So we talked about caffeine, right? Imagine you've got your 20 athletes and they've all done their 3x4 blueprint and they're on gene fit. <clears throat> and now you can see which athletes really are fast metabolizers of caffeine if they possess that SNP, which ones are medium metabolizers and which ones are slow. Well, now before a game starts, you're going to say, okay, at 90 minutes or 120 minutes out, you guys are taking your caffeine hit here of this exact milligrams, you know, like 265 milligrams for you at this time. And then you go down. That's a lot more specific than me doing the 30 minute timer and everyone come hit it. Because the problem there is too that there's a whole other part, depending on where you are in that genetic variation, you might be at an increased risk of anxiety because of caffeine mm. after the game or an increased risk of a sleep disturbance. Like we've all heard people are like, I can drink caffeine and go straight to bed, right? But there's other people where it's like, if I have caffeine, I'm up until like four in the morning, right? But I want to perform well for my game or whatever it might be. And so now we can make situations where we're not just focusing on the performance, but now recovery after it. It's, it's much more of an upstream approach and just attacking symptoms and what we need right now. We're saying, okay, here's the end goal. You have to play this game, but you'll have to recover for another game in two days if you're, you know, maybe you're playing basketball. Sure. And so now by being able to be that specific, that's just one thing, caffeine, right? We can look at creatine, we can look at nitrate and the specificity in which we can program is key. And so I think the ultimate story around gene fit for me as a strength coach is that we really are taking a lot of the guesswork out and we're being a lot more efficient with our time and our decisions which, you know, and anything with sports or training, that's the key. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, it's really interesting. And I guess, I guess my, my question I want to ask before I forget, it was the, it was built around feedback from coaches, right? Like, I think that's always the biggest barrier. Anytime any new, any new, any new idea is presented, right? It's always like, oh, what is the coach going to say? Right? Like, what's he, what's he got to say about this? What's she got to say about this? Right. Um, and I, I wonder, and I'm, I don't, I don't believe this, but I'm just going to kind of like play devil's advocate here and just kind of like give you, you know, what I, what yeah. I said, like, Hey, like, you know, listen, I've had success doing this and this and this, and uh, we haven't had to look at genetics in a while and, you know, forever, whatever, my time doing this, right? Or something along the lines of like, how do we make sure that we go about, say that you have a coach who is open to it and they're like, how do we make sure we go about doing this to the point where we're not like, almost like, I don't know the best word to say, but like, like uh, over analyzing, you know what I mean? To the point where we're like, like pigeonholing ourselves and kind of like holding ourselves back from yeah. making, just like, Cause like per personally, like, and I'll let you answer this, but I, I don't see this as like the same as kind of, um, getting married to like GPS data, right. To what the point where like, it's like literally dictating all the decisions you make. I don't see this as anywhere remotely the same thing, but like, I, I could see a coach seeing that, right. Like and saying like, Hey, like it's more yeah. data and we're just, you know, we're kind of like, you know, an paralysis by analysis type thing, you know what I mean? And obviously, so have you come across that? Like, how do you handle that? And yeah. So I think there's two parts of that. The first is you're saying like, I've had success doing this in the past. Why would I change? Yeah. Like when we look at the landscapes of sports and, and, and like the injury research, injuries are only going up. Yeah. So no one is solved today. Like I think the Premier League last season had 534 million pounds of injury burden, the highest ever. 
the NFL, not this season, but the season before the numbers, I think we're at $600 million injury burden, which mm-hmm. was way up there. And it's like, okay, we're not solving the injury crisis. Sure. And I know it's a sensitive subject because every team is different in the ways that we go about our training. And of course there's off season training with some of these sports and soccer is a little bit different because you have the athletes for almost 11 months in a lot of the cases. And so the off season training, although it's really important, may not have as big as an effect where like, you know, in the NFL or NBA, they might be going with a whole different trainer and a whole different system. And you don't know what they have the chronic base, but the conversation there is that what we've been doing now, people may have won championships or whatever it might be, but you know, if, if you're growth minded, you believe that there is room for improvement. And if the injury burden is just going up and up and up, that can't just be our future. We can't just be our story is that injuries are going to get worse and they're going to pile up more and more because when you talk to ownerships and when you talk to, you know, front office staff, they want to have a solution. Sure. And all we're saying now in the second part of your question is like the overanalyzation of too much data. I think this is where gene fit has make it, made it very simple. You're looking at the same data you've looked at before. So in soccer, we might be looking at total distance high-speed running, accelerations and decelerations. And we are trying to say, what are the demands of the match and how can we best train for those demands of the match on a weekly basis in order to achieve a new level of fitness at the end of the season, at least in the MLS, because there's playoffs, and right? And so now you're saying, we're just going to give you the genetic insights that is the foundation of all the training data you're collecting now. So you're going to look at the data the same. However, you're going to have a little bit more insight into how that affects each individual specifically from a tissue standpoint, right? When it comes to recovery, instead of our students say, okay, our region today, everyone's going to bike, everyone's going to foam roll, everyone's going to drink a cherry juice. You know, we can actually say, no, it for all 26 of you, here's your specific plan of supplementation, lifestyle, or, you know, whatever that lifestyle can be, the training environment. Sure. How are we going to manipulate that to get you back? And also knowing that with some of you, some of you are going to recover quicker and some of you are going to recover slower. Sure. And there shouldn't be the stress of like everyone recovers in the same exact time. Yeah. So I think when we have those conversations with coaches, they actually say, you know what, it helps because sometimes our biggest enemy is ourselves. We have our own bias and we need some of the challenges. If we have data that is showing us something just a little bit different that we might see as a head coach, I still have to make my own decision, but it does help to say, okay, maybe that athlete isn't as fit as I thought, or maybe he is much more fit than our staff thought sure. and we can play in more minutes. So that's what we found so far. And that's, that's the feedback, which has been really helpful to see. Um, but yeah, we're hoping that, uh, well, I should say, actually, we're pretty confident that the injury crisis, the people that get on gene fit are going to have a lot better solutions than doing the same old thing they're doing right now. So we're just kind of challenging that status quo a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what you want, right? Like we're just trying to move in the right direction. Just moving. It's not going to be perfect, right? But you guys are trying to obviously get as close to that as possible. Um, obviously I know, I know we're, you know, you somewhat of a not time crunch, but I would, I would want to be sensitive to your time. We're at about 40 minutes now. So I wanted to give you the opportunity if there's anything else that you really wanted to like express, you know what I mean? Without me asking questions, just like anything that you really wanted to make sure that you got on the, you know, I'll utilize this platform. Now would be the time to do it. Like anything that you want the people to know about what you guys have going on, any, you know, final thoughts or whatever, like feel free to take as much. I know, you know, you got a uh, commitment at one, so whatever. No, no, for sure. Time, but yeah, I would say, no, I think on the gene fit stuff, like if anyone has questions about gene fit, obviously hit me up, uh, Daniel at three X four genetics.com and happy to answer questions. Like whenever I have an ending statement on any sort of conversation that's going to be public, yeah. the biggest thing I come to is like, like, like how can we bridge people together instead of like having these dividing walls? And so um, I've tried to be more active on Twitter this year. My Twitter handle is uh, at Daniel P. Guzman. Nice. Uh, so I try to be really active and involved in a lot of conversations. And my main goal is, is twofold. Number one, I really want to connect people because I think SNC Twitter can get super divided all the time. And it's over these little things. And and what I want to come across, at least this is my own personal view, it's okay that we disagree on what squad is the best or what conditioning tool is the best, or whatever it might be. What's not okay is that we go over the line and we start judging people based on what their preferences is for training. Sure. And I just really hope that people can stay open and try and find successful exits to conversations where if they can see it's not going down the right path because you're feeling offended or you might be offending them, We'll take it offline or yeah, publicly say, look, sorry, this might've got a little too heated. Happy to talk about somewhere else. I know apologizing on Twitter seems to be like something you don't do, but uh, like, I think it's the best route to keep people connected. And at the end of the day, you don't have to agree on stuff, right? But you can have these successful exits to conversation. So Mm. that that's like my big thing that I'm trying to push right now. Uh, Other than that, 
I started a newsletter, which I'm really excited about. So nice. that'll be in all my social media. And really the purpose of that is just to say, I worked in pro sports for 10 years. I want to give people like we talked about in the beginning, a view of what, like how messy training can be. And just like some audibles and real conversations about how to get out of that. I don't have the magic pill, it's just my experience. So if people want to check that out, that's kind of the few things that I'm working on right now. All right. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm glad you, you plugged the, the Twitter there and obviously just give people a chance to like reach out to you, create more conversation around it, right? If they have questions, I'm sure there's a ton of people who have more questions than I was able to ask here. But that's the idea of the podcast anyway, it's just to stimulate, you know, the idea and the desire to go dig deeper and to do your own homework, right? So I'm not gonna, you can't get all the answers here in a, in a 45 minute podcast. But, um, yeah. you know, that that's awesome. And I appreciate you hopping on, Daniel, and you did an excellent job of explaining all these things. And I'm super interested. Like, I think this stuff is fantastic. I've got some, some ideas and things I want to run by you actually when we hop off the air. But but uh, I think yeah, you know it's, it's really it's really cool. And for all who, those who are listening, obviously, I'm gonna put you know I'll, I'll put the um, the Twitter handle and obviously some of the website stuff that we talked about in the show notes. So um, we'll take care of all that stuff. But uh, yeah, appreciate you hopping on, and uh, listeners, we'll uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Daniel, thanks again, brother. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.